Hi, this is Randy Randall of No Age and host of the podcast Hyphen It with Randy Randall. I want to welcome our newest sponsor of the show, DistroKid. DistroKid helps musicians get their music on all the major streaming platforms and artists keep 100% of their royalties. Hyphenate listeners get 30% off at distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash hyphenate. Again, that's distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash H-Y-P-H-E-N-A-T-E. Go get your music streaming everywhere now. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome and thank you for tuning in and downloading or streaming however you are getting this sound into your ears. Uh, Thank you for doing that. And the name of the show is Hyphenate with me, Randy Randall. This is the show where I talk to interesting people who are good at more than one thing or do more than one thing or have done more than one thing, which I think if we're being honest is most of us, right? I mean, who only does one thing? I I wonder if there was this, uh, even when there was a time when somebody would have a, what they would call a career, it was never just the one thing. I think, you know, that's where hobbies and bowling leagues and recreational centers came from, right? Pool halls, card games, uh, garages, garage bands, tracks. I just don't know how uh, we interact with each other. I guess it's more of these virtual spaces or online spaces. I see things like bowling alleys. There was a big one uh, here in Burbank. It was closing down. And it just seemed like, you know, it's a different, different time, a bygone era where people would go meet up places. I think coffee shops and virtual spaces sort of fill the void that do a lot of those other things. But, you know, social animals and doing things outside of whatever we do for money, I think is where life always gets interesting. But, you know, people are so quick to put it down as, well, it's not a real thing. It's a hobby. It's, a, you know, just something you mess around with. But I think that's really what gives life its little extra bump or kick or not even extra i think it's a necessary necessary kind of kick um so anyway i'm rambling hope everybody's having good holidays uh i know we're in between the uh thanksgiving fun and the christmas fun uh i got two small kids and so this is always a lot of you know going on at this time and uh you know I, mean, I, I always try to have that gratitude mindset, <laughs> especially when things get crazy or when there's presents and wild madness and pictures with Santa Claus at the mall and, you know, trying to park at the mall and figure all that stuff out. It's, uh, it's uh, that feeling of like, you know, I get to do these things. Not that I have to do these things, but I, I get to, you know, these are fun opportunities to, to you know, spend time with, with everybody. Um, but it's not to say there aren't challenges and things we face, but uh, but I hope everyone's doing well with that in this time of year and just giving themselves lots of little breaks. I find that works best for me in my life. Just like, okay, I need to tap out in five minutes and just go, go stare off at your phone or stare off at the wall or <laughs> something. <laughs> just take a minute, take a beat, just and uh, remember how fun it's supposed to be. Well, that was the idea and begin with, whether it's <laughs> fun at the time or not. Um, but I am really excited to welcome on today's show uh mr silas height now you might not know uh silas's name uh but i think this is going to be a great interview silas uh has an awesome story of growing up in a small uh desert southwest town and moving to los angeles and uh his uncle is uh mark mothersbaugh from the band devo and from all of these incredible um you know film soundtracks and commercials and things you don't even know that I feel like Mark Mother's Ba has had a huge impact on modern culture and modern music that uh, has invisible tendrils that reach out and Silas uh, was part of seeing behind the curtain and you know saw the wizard at work and as well as you know developed his own incredible uh, music career as from commercial music to um, you know his own creative music project. He was trained as a percussionist, but has done all these incredible, beautiful pieces of music that you can find online. If you search for Silas Height, that's S I L A S and then last name Height H I T E. And, um, when we first recorded this, uh, this was an earlier recording I did, and uh, I bumped into Silas at our local grocery store. We were neighbors. We were introduced through a mutual friend, uh, 
and um we were talking i was like i got a podcast and he was like all right i got a new record coming out and so i apologize silas this took longer than i originally thought it would uh, to come out i know you were promoting the record there uh, when we first did this over the summer but i wanted to make sure we got it out and up and uh, encourage everybody to go check out all of your music on the streaming sites and um yeah thank you thank you for for coming in coming over to the garage and doing this at uh yeah, it's great. And now uh, he just Silas just reached out, going, "When is this? Re- when's this episode going to come out? What, what happened to that thing?" But also to inform me that he is no longer lives in our little tiny burg uh, north of L.A. You know, that he is actually now uh, a resident of the great state of Ohio. So thank you, Silas. Cannot wait to uh, bump into you in a grocery store in Ohio next time we're there. so much for coming on the podcast thanks for having me yeah man um it's great to have a neighbor over this is you're you're one of you're one of the first uh, neighbors i met in the neighborhood yeah i'm a couple blocks away it's great (laughs) what uh what first uh, drew you up to the sunland area uh it was affordable (laughs) i always lived in eagle rock and highland park before it got super cool and everyone was like it's gonna get cool and you know this was 20 years ago and i'm like i'm waiting i'm waiting but it the cool thing about it was there was always musicians and composers and artists like that was always kind of the scene and then people not related to the entertainment industry which was kind of nice too um but then eventually yeah it just got so insanely expensive we were like you know what let's just buy a house build a studio and um you know we were able to do that here yeah yeah, same. It's that funny thing when, you know, when you're young, it's like, I don't know, it's just a neighborhood and it doesn't seem that hip. And you realize like you were part of the yeah. hipness of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I <know>? hope so. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> or some type of, some type of that you gotta kind of wave and then eventually it gets too expensive. I know I'm, I'm still waiting for Sunland to get too expensive. I don't know if it's happened. Yeah. I'm still waiting for it to get cool. It needs some cool businesses, you know, like some, some fun bars and restaurants and stuff like that. It's yeah. a little lackluster on that side, but yeah, the brick and mortar world. Is yeah. Still kind of everything's, but it's very beautiful. Like taking a break from working and just you know taking a walk around the block after recording or whatever and just it's it's pretty quiet and beautiful and the mountains are huge it's nice yeah my uh, my barometer is uh is the sizzler on the corner here of sunland boulevard Uh, when that changes uh then i'll know we've jumped the shark and i'll know our neighborhood has become fancy once that abandoned sizzler (laughs) it's been empty for five years since we moved here about five years ago we're like why when will this be something (laughs) my favorite tag is when someone put the extra er at the end the sizzler sizzler (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah no i know that's that that's the barometer that's the canary in the coal mine when that when that abandoned sizzler is either demolished or turned into something else Mm -hmm. then i'll know okay things are changing yeah you know what's interesting though when i talk to creative people that do live here they always tell me about a bunch of other creative people that also live in the neighborhood but i think because there's not very many hip places to go um you don't see them, you know, we don't right. see each other so oh, much. Yeah. There's not like uh, like cool bars to congregate at or other things like that. Restaurants, whatever, or a coffee shop, coffee shops. Yeah. yeah there's stores. like one good coffee shop and it's great, but like, you know, I, I don't know. We're missing that. I think that would kind of pull the community together. But yeah. So tell me about yourself. Where, where do you come from? And I grew up in Arizona in a small gold mining town called crown King. It's uh, in the middle of the Prescott National Forest, and it's up in the mountains, and it's absolutely gorgeous, but there's only about 100 people there. Um, dirt roads, no government, no police, nothing. I went to a one-room school with just a handful of other kids, and um, it was an awesome experience, like just running around in the woods all day as a kid. You know, I mean, obviously, I haven't to go to school, but after that, being able to just play in the woods all day. and um, there's, But it's so small, there's no high school. And so when kids make it through eighth grade, they would have to either like go live with family elsewhere or your family would move or, you know, something like that. But there happened to be a boarding school called the Orm School in central Arizona, which was maybe an hour and a half from where I grew up. And so I went to boarding school, moved out at 14, went there because I didn't want my folks to have to leave Crown King because it's really beautiful there. And, uh, yeah, I went to boarding school. It was awesome. Like had a great time, made lifelong friends and, uh, then U of A, uh, for college in Tucson because they had a great percussion program. And I started off playing drums when I was a kid and then sort of picked up instruments along the way. 
and studied there. And then ended up, after I graduated, I started working in L.A. at my uncle's studio. He has a studio in Hollywood called Mutato Musica. Okay, hold on. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. I want to go back to the gold mining school. Hold okay. On. okay. We've got plenty of time. We're going okay. to we're gonna get to the, the transformation to L.A. But, okay, so was it an active gold mining town? Yeah, until I was about maybe five or six. Okay. Um, my dad worked at the mine, but it was too... He knew it was too dangerous to work inside the mine because there's always accidents at my, in mines. And so he was mostly a, the drill doctor. Like he fixed the drills, which were constantly breaking, of course, because they're, you know, being used. And um, so he worked for the mine. And then my mother worked for the mine also as a, uh, she worked in the boarding house. And so she cooked for all these miners that lived in this giant boarding house. And it was like, yeah. I'll, if I had to guess, you know, this was a long time ago, but I'm going to say 20 to 25 miners, maybe more, maybe more. And she cooked for them and I'd come home from school, which was just, you know, up the dirt road. I'd walk, walk home and like meet her there. And so I knew all these old miners who were awesome. You know, they had names like Snuffy and Shorty and Injun Joe or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's great nicknames. And they were pretty gruff dudes. Like it wasn't really a place for a kid, but they love my mom and I think they all missed their families. It seemed like, and so they were really sweet to me and like, they would give me birthday presents and like, I'd come in and they'd, you know, maybe clean up their language a little, and, <laughs> you know, but be, be super friendly. And of course they knew my dad. And, um, so yeah. And then I think around 86, 87, something like that, the mine pulled out of crown King and that was the last one that was running, but it had been like booming in the twenties and thirties and they'd built a railroad up into the mountains to get the gold out and get people back and forth because there was thousands of people living there at the time. And, uh, but then when the mines went bust, I want to say, I should know this, but I think it was in the thirties when most of them dried up, they pulled out the railroad tracks. And so now the only way to get there is our dirt roads and the dirt roads used to be either for wagons or the trains. And so it's a 26 mile dirt road to get, wow. <laughs> yeah, to get home. My folks still live there. It's awesome. Wow. And any yeah. other brothers and sisters? Nope. Just, just you. Yeah. What do you, do you know what brought your folks out there? What was yeah, their they, journey? They actually met there. Um, my mom had been going to school in Mexico and that didn't work out. And then she ended up in Prescott and needed a job. And she saw an advertisement for a fire lookout. You know, the people that sit in lookout oh, towers and look yeah. for fires. And she was like, what the heck is this? So she went to Crown King and was like, whoa, where am I? You know, this looks amazing. So she, uh, she took that job for the summer. And my dad happened to be working for the Forest Service on a fire crew, like maintaining the forest, fighting fires, that kind of thing. And they met that way. And that was it. They've been together ever since. That was the late seventies, and they got pregnant with me. And this, the way what they told me was, they were like, "This just seems like a really safe, idyllic place to raise a kid. You know, like a really cool lifestyle. Let's let's do it." Wow. And how many other kids were there in the town? You said there's a school. Yeah. What, what, how many so when the mine was have? running, there might be up to twenty, roughly, um, give or take. But people were constantly moving, you know, in and out. Um, miners can be a bit transient you know what i mean or and i don't mean that in a bad way but that's just sort of goes with the with the job so people would come and go and uh but when the schools close or when the mine closed there was probably usually there'd be five to eight kids and that's kindergarten through eighth grade like so some grades didn't have any kids you know and we were all together in a room in a one-room schoolhouse. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, definitely it sounds like a like a movie or a prestige sort of TV show, right? <laughs> this weird, kind of yeah. like, you know, this is sort of surreal life. I've grown to really appreciate it the older I've gotten. You know, I think I did even as a kid, but but now I'm like, oh, what an amazing, bizarre place to be raised. And, and then in terms of like your cultural sort of um, input mm -hmm. with something like that, I mean, I, I, my, the mind wanders, right? But did, was it radio, TV, obviously pre-internet, we know that. But, yeah, pre-internet. Radio just, stations were pretty rough, <laughs> didn't come in very well, but sometimes you get them in. And um, TV didn't really come in until I was older, like maybe middle school or something age. So I didn't really have a lot of TV. Um, my grandparents would make VHS tapes, like tape cartoons or whatever, and send them to us, movies and stuff. Um, but we were big readers. Like my mom founded the library there. Um, there wasn't one. She started it and it's still there. She's still the librarian. So, and my father's a big reader as well. So we would just, we read tons. Um, my dad also played music. And so he was a musician and would, you know, jam there. And that was an influence on me for sure. What did he play? 
Um, I'd say guitar is his main thing, but he plays guitar, bass. He played drums for a little bit as well. And, you know, he's the kind of guy like myself that would pick up something and just try and make some sound with it, you know. But he's a good guitar player. He's definitely better than me. <laughs> That's amazing. And and so we were, we were about to get to the point where your uncle is... You you're gonna tell me that story, but but I'm curious yeah. how how what is the relationship between your father and your uncle? Like did, did they're not related? They're not related. No, oh, it's my okay. mom's brothers. Oh, your mom. Okay, yeah, Mark and Bob Mothers Ba Devo. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, um, and that's the studio I started working at as an intern when I moved out here from college. I begged for uh, an internship. Um, I begged for a job, and he was you know was like ah we don't really hire people here and like I don't really need anyone and I definitely like hiring families weird I don't really think it's a great idea and I was like all right this coming like, from the guy who's famously in the band of all brothers right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's That's he's done his point. time with family business I'm sure by that point <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, well like, yeah maybe that was the maybe what that was, informed yeah. it that's funny but I'm wondering I didn't really so, think about so, that. so your mom was the cousin of Bob and and no it's their sister sister oh wait right right okay I've got you yeah. right okay so sister mm-hmm. okay got younger older younger the, sister okay yeah. and, so, and, the, and they were in in ohio mm-hmm. in, they all grew up in akron in ohio akron. yeah mm-hmm. yep okay and then that and then your mom left to go to school to, to mexico yeah. and kind of left uh-huh. so so that was part of what it was all about was her leaving mm-hmm. ohio in the 70s yeah in, in that in that sort of environment looking yeah, for both something my different. Fo- my dad's from pennsylvania he left you know maybe a little before that and they um they both just fell in love with the southwest i think you know it's so different, right? Than mm-hmm. than, mm-hmm. than Akron, mentality wise and uh, geography, weather, all that stuff. Yeah, and it's funny. I have a love of Ohio because I would go back in the summers to visit my grandparents, my mother's parents, and um, and would stay there every summer and just like kind of fall in love with it. And it seems so magical to me because it was so wet and green and like just totally different. Um, and I think my parents just, they still think of the Midwest as just like, you know, a lot of rain and snow and like <laughs> just, uh, you know, whatever it's their cold baggage and was. crowded. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah I, I mean, they still have some love for it, but they're, they're hardcore West, West Coast. That's incredible. So, yeah, Southwest the, people. The, the dream of the West, you know, Westerns mm-hmm, and the you know, things we, mm-hmm. you know, we'll get to later in the interview, but that idea probably pulled them in, but whatever they saw growing up, what their idea of the West was. I don't know. know. I mean, I would yeah. imagine, but. Yeah, yeah. but you experienced it. It was your, it was your I, life. Yeah, I definitely experienced it. Um, yeah, I grew up with it and was in Arizona until I was 23, I guess, and then moved here. And, you know, California is still very much the West in a lot of ways. L.A. can be a bubble, but I've never lived in, like, the Hollywood part or, like, the, you know, the beach or any of that. So I feel like I've... I've tried to stay out of the bubble a little bit. Like, you know what I mean? If that makes any sense. Oh yeah. It always seemed, so the studio I worked at, my uncle's studio is on sunset Boulevard and it's like right in the heart of the sunset strip. Super cool place. Great place to work. But, uh, you would look outside and there was just so much like Hollywood ness everywhere. The people that, you know, people preening, like, is anyone taking my picture? Is it, you know, dressed up for like paparazzi, whatever. And I'm not trying to knock on it, but I just couldn't relate to it. And so I always lived far away. And that's why I lived in Eagle Rock, because I was like, okay, this seems more normal to me. Yeah. <laughs> and I could kind of handle the vibe, you know? And so the commute was awful, but um, I just needed that bit of normalcy after coming home from work. Well, the the Musato building, for, for people that don't know it at home, I mean, can, can you describe? I mean, that's a bit of a... Of yeah, a, it's of very a... cool. It's... Um, lime green and it's round it looks like a spaceship and it's it's uh very weird for a studio like the, the curved walls aren't really helpful but you know we worked around it and it was okay and it was on sunset boulevard in the height in the in the middle of the sunset strip. Yeah, yeah right down from whiskey row and it was across from tower records so when tower was open i'd go over there on my lunch break and you know just buy way too many cds and stuff it's great. Yeah. So definitely was it was not a studio that was trying to blend in. If anything, it was it was there was a bit of a look at me factor for a music studio, which was a little unusual and still is. Yeah. Little, you know. Well, you know, I think um my uncle's a visual artist and I think it's just a representation of his, you know, large personality probably. 
yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But it's it's funny when I think about you know the Hollywood, you know, and then you know c- coming from from Arizona and then uh-huh. to, to a, <laughs> landing at a, at a yeah. job at, yeah, in no a wonder. spaceship on the middle of the Sunset Strip. There's mm-hmm. a there's a bit of a, a disc. You can see the juxtaposition now. Like, okay, I don't know if this particular yeah. part of Hollywood. I don't want to live here exactly. <laughs> sort but, of being in the middle of Disneyland or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. The degree, studio you know, was like yeah. a blend of like a toy store meets a music studio meets a art factory it was awesome um i really loved it like honestly i felt like it fit my personality a lot i'm really into art music and just having this creative space was incredible i think the only thing i didn't like about it was the the location um and then after a while you know i worked there for seven years it was awesome Wait, can I skip ahead? Or no, do you no, want me no. To yeah, stop? I want to go. Sorry, yeah, okay, I, want, I wanted to go. Fine, so, okay, yeah. so even, but even yeah, yeah. the we're jumping around a little bit, but the yeah. so so study percussion at, mm-hmm. at university. Studied, yep, yeah, percussion, and um, actually created my degree. It was business, art, and music, and you know, it was mostly just business or mostly music and art. Um, the, I just always loved music and art. I was pretty sure I was going in the music direction, but I've just, I've always felt like art was just tied into it, you know, in that part of my brain. And so I was making visual art at the same time, but wasn't, I didn't really have the pressure on the visual art to be like, oh, this is my career, you know? So that was kind of nice. I could really just enjoy it. And, uh, I think I learned a lot of lessons actually from art, um, that I've applied to music, but yeah, studying music, there was a, um, recording, studio on campus in the music school so that was cool i interned there for as long as they would let me um tried to you know absorb everything there because i as i went through music school i realized like i didn't really like performing other people's music like so i was like okay i was kind of ruling things out as i went along i was like i love music there's so many facets what am i going to do i don't know and i kind of was like okay i don't like performing other people's music So probably not going to be like in an orchestra or, you know, um, a session player or something like that. I, not that I have the chops for that, but, (laughs) but like, I'm not going to pursue that. Um, I really like creating my own stuff. So maybe, you know, maybe composing. And so, you know, took some experimental composition classes, which are great and some more traditional ones. And, and the business side was just because I saw so many musicians and artists that I respected, like clearly struggling, you know, like it's hard to make a living in music and art. Um, and so I was like, okay, I need a little bit of, little bit of information here to, you know. And I think it's helped somewhat. I mean, I'm certainly no business guru, but you know, I don't know. I've been able to do it successfully for 20 years now. So, knock on wood, you know. Yeah, but talk about like the the basis of a multi hyphenate, uh, multi hyphenated life, right? I guess Is, so you know, yeah. creating your own yeah. your own um, major in college, you know, music, art, and business. I mean, what a what a uh, you know the the nexus point of all yeah. those things sort of set set you up in in some ways for sort of a life that was not going to be lived in just one one box. It's true, yeah. That's yeah. yeah, that's fairly incredible. And then and then so you said when you when you what was the draw of LA? Was it the idea to work for your uncle, or how did you know your uncle, or what was what was your relationship prior to working there? Uh, I mean, I knew him, but not not really well because he was in Los Angeles by the time I was born. Devo was already like you know, famous and kind of at the height of what they were doing when I was born. And, um, and then when I was a kid, he transitioned into doing more composing for film and TV and stuff has a great career doing that. Actually both uncles. Um, and, uh, I think Los Angeles, the draw was I wanted to be a composer and it kind of seemed like the only place to do that was LA. And so I was going to move here one way or the other, but of course he was my first stop in terms of like, can you help me out? You know, making, you know, getting my foot in the door um, but I was going to try and do it anyway. And it's funny, I forgot about this, but I was just talking to my wife about it the other day. My backup plans, <laughs> if it didn't work out with being a composer in LA, I wanted to audition for Stomp or Blue Man Group. <laughs> being a, you know, being a percussionist, I was like, well, and I did theater like in high school and stuff. So I was like, you know, I could, I could do that. I could ham it up. Makes sense. Yeah. Have you or ever, give it a shot anyway. Have you ever put on all the blue makeup just for kicks? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a nightly <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. I had a friend who was a drummer, and we went up to San Francisco to, for him to audition for oh. for one of those. I think it was Blue Man, maybe. Cool. You know, he, he did, but um, he didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure the tough. allure. Well, it must be a grinder. It must be a meat grinder. They yeah. just they go through talented percussionists and drummers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's that that kind of schedule and that sort of thing. You know, I'm sure is hard. I probably wouldn't have made it either, but like back, you know, when you're 23 or whatever, you're just nothing but hope and optimism, and or at least I was. Oh, I was yeah. like. 
you know, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But I like that as a backup plan. Okay, if I can't yeah. become a, a composer for film and TV, and, yeah. or, you know, and I will put makeup on and, and perform on stage. I guess if I have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love I love the idea of the, what the backup plans were. Um, so so you come out and then and then with some cajoling, you know, mm-hmm. you, what what is your first sort of assignment like, or what is what are you working on, or how um, does that sort of? I had the glamorous the tasks of walking the dog and making the coffee, and, you know, running errands for the studio that kind of stuff like they really i was just an intern um which was fair because i really knew jack about writing music for film tv whatever because back then college didn't really prepare you for that at least the one i was at didn't even have classes for it you know um but what i was able to do is um you know we had multiple composers on staff and so when commercials would come in everybody could write for it and you know maybe you write three tracks maybe you write 20 tracks it didn't matter and we would send them to the you know to the ad agency the ad agency would go through them and they would pick the one they liked and whoever got it the um you know then they were that was their job and they would see it through to the end um and so it was kind of competitive you know and you got a bonus obviously if it went i shouldn't say obviously but you got a bonus if it went final or whatever and so in those scenarios, it didn't hurt to have somebody that didn't know what they were doing really to, to write some things. You know, worst case scenario, we review things before it went out. And if it wasn't up to par or something, we might not send it or something, you know, if they didn't think it was good enough. But, you know, it was 30 second chunks. And so that's how I cut my teeth and got that was my first door into composing was those 30 second chunks for commercials. And I would just I would get to the studio at like four in the morning or five in the morning and people weren't getting in until 10, you know, and I would just work for like as long as I could until they're like, Oh, you you know, you need to make some coffee or, you know, go run errands or whatever. And so I would just write as much as I could. And, and eventually I started getting the commercials and then I started getting a lot of them. And eventually they're like, Oh, okay. You need to be in the studio, like making us money rather than walking the dog. We'll get another intern. So thankfully that worked out because he had only given me a trial period. He was like, I'll give you a couple of months see how it goes if it doesn't work you know sorry but i'll give you a shot so fortunately by that when that came around like i was already i guess showing enough promise to keep me on so were you playing in bands like rock traditional rock bands or did you have in college yeah in college in college yeah um played in bands mostly two bands i was a a drummer for a surf surf rock group called zero to 60 which was awesome super fun scrappy We'd go play in Mexico and like play all over parties and stuff. It was really fun. And uh, then I was, it was more like, a, then another band that was kind of like a pop dance band that just incorporated a lot of different genres and styles, which I really liked. And they were all older than me and like probably better musicians. And so I liked that because I had to play up to their level. And that was called The Beating. And the songs were just incredibly. They were really good, especially for college level people. Like, uh, like even listening back, I'm like, dang, the songwriter, not me, the songwriter had a lot of talent. Um, anyway, but then, you know, college was over and I was like, look, if you guys want to move to LA, we can keep the band together. But like, I got to go try and do this. So. LA is calling me. Um, yeah. And then in terms of writing music, you know, what, you, what, when you were studying at school, mm-hmm. were you studying composition and, and uh-huh. writing and reading music, playing piano? Mm-hmm. And what was, what was that journey? Like? Yeah. So drums well, and a rock, drums and two rock bands or, you know, and then yeah, I was playing drums in one band, like drum set, which is my first instrument. And then like lots of different percussion instruments in the other one. And, um, in college yeah there was a little bit of writing assignments but like i don't know most of it was like uh like lessons or something like right using this you know figured baseline write a 16 bars of a classical piece that would fit into this whatever you know and that kind of thing which i didn't really relate to but i understood the importance of um learning that stuff and then uh yeah that was kind of it and then on uh, that was taking the experimental composition, which was more like taking audio. It was more computer based, taking audio from different sources and like how to manipulate it and change it to sound like whatever you want it to sound like and that kind of stuff, almost like sound design. And that, you know, later in my career has become super useful um, for lots of different things, you know, being able to just manipulate sound and knowing like hearing one sound and being like, can I change that into this other sound that I need? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, writing a bit, but like by the time I graduated college, I really hadn't written much that would say this, this person could write for film or 
television. So I, you know, presented the meager things that I had written to my uncle, and you know, he chuckled, was like, "Okay, well, you got some learning to do, but you know." <laughs> and this is like on a cassette tape or something. CD, done. So burnt CD, okay, CD. burnt CDs, okay, yep. Yeah, top of the line at the time. Yep. Yeah. And then, so then, as you're going in, in between walking the dogs and making coffee, would you would say you would write, you'd get a pitch, or you'd get a request for for proposal or ideas of, um, f- you know something in the style of or what would those requests be like and how would you then what would your kind of journey be at least in the beginning you know mm-hmm. i'm curious how that changes from I, where you started yeah. to where you are now like it was all over the map at yeah. first, i mean commercials i still do a ton of commercials and they're still it's all over the map you never know if they're going to be like can you do something in the vein of john williams you know empire strikes back theme or like can you do something it could be very vague something upbeat and fun and you're like, well, is there any genre or, but usually you don't even have someone to ask questions to, you know, it's like, it's very, uh, In your head. yeah. And so, yeah, you kind of just have to follow your gut. And I think my, I definitely listened back to the stuff that I was successful with early on. And like the production, I think was horrible. The mixes sucked, but it was really creative Um, I will give myself that. Like, it was weird, and it stood out. And that worked really well, because the people that would approach our studio, you know, Mark is known for weird and out of the box, you know, outside the box kind of thinking. And so they wanted something like that. They didn't want a really traditional whatever, typically. And so I was able to, you know, I felt like that was my strength, was my creativity, more so than my um, composition chops or mixing, producing. But I mean, I was working on that stuff constantly, just reading all the time, mixing magazines, whatever, trying to learn that stuff in all my free time, working on more music, um, you know, picking the brain of the engineers that worked there. There was another fellow from Devo, Bob Two, who is also another brother that was the pretty much the in-house engineer there. And he was incredibly sweet, super funny, cool dude. And I would, um, you know, ask him questions as much as I could without annoying him <laughs> no but he was super friendly yeah. and helpful but you know i'd yeah. be like bob how the heck do i get the sound you know and he'd be like ah oh, it's easy you just do this <laughs> and then so you would go in and and start writing meaning you would start recording sounds right you weren't writing it on a piece of paper i guess for people that don't know no, at home i mean not piece of paper i would have so back then it started out with um i, I had a laptop I bought a laptop and it had logic on it and i had samples so like samples of violin, samples of anything you can think of, really. And because I was there, they had a ton of samples of everything, every sample library. So that was really nice. That's a big hurdle when you're a young composer is not being able to afford good sounds to work with. And so, I mean, even now it's a constant challenge. You constantly have to upgrade and it's like it's expensive. But I had these sounds. So I had like a little keyboard that was attached to my laptop and I would write and record these things within Logic and mix them there. Um cool. The the other thing that was really nice though is there was there were a few other composers there and they were all much older than me. I was like younger, um, but, but they had more experience and we would help each other. And so like at the time I wasn't a very confident guitar or bass player. And so my buddy that worked there, John, would come and play guitar and bass on my stuff, and I'd play drums on his stuff because you know the more live instruments you can have on something, usually the better it's going to sound or the better reception it'll get from people listening to it. Unless you're going for, of course, like EDM or something. But so we would help each other in that way. Like I'd walk into his studio and he'd, you know, and give him my two cents and he'd come into mine and, you know, I'd be like, oh, I've been mixing this for hours. I'm pulling my hair out. And he'd be like, oh, you need bass is a little loud. This needs to come down. Mute that. You don't need that. Whatever. And I'd be like, oh, thank you. And it's, I do miss that being freelance, like working on my own. I really, I miss that. Um, helpful camaraderie and a fresh set of ears fresh set of ears hear, to hear something yeah, that you're, yeah. you're just missing yeah um do you think it was a value that your age like coming in as a younger you mentioned you know the other the other writers were older i mean that especially in, in ad world like are they look you know looking for something new something fresh something weird you were probably closer ear to the ground of what was happening contemporary Maybe. at that time yeah, I, I would say so probably yeah. a little bit yeah um and also I think just I had the energy of being young and like also, you know, I hadn't proved myself at all in life. I was a 23 year old, you know, and like this is like my first real, real career type job, you know, in in the direction I wanted to go. And so I just gave it all of my energy and love and passion and everything, you know, and uh, 
you know, I mean, being 10 years younger than people, you do have more energy, you know, and like I, I would get up in the middle of the night and go to work because I wanted, I wanted to have five more hours than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. And you needed the five more I hours. I probably, probably did yeah. need it too. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I will say that because of that, like we got, we got, you know, multiple commercials in every week and then after I moved up from commercials, like we were doing commercials, TV shows, video games, movies. I mean, the the work just coming in was so fast and so much that I learned to be a very fast composer. Um, not really think twice about what I'm doing, just follow my instincts. And it's very rare for me to write something and be like, that doesn't work. You know, like I'll know pretty darn quickly if it's not working. Um, and so that was like one of the best things I learned there was just how to trust myself, how to get the sounds I want quickly and just do it time is such an is such a crucial thing in, in that mm -hmm. world right of, of writing mm -hmm. and the turnaround like how yeah. quickly can we hear something high quality mm -hmm. back in, in the shortest amount of time as possible well and not only commercials but like now or, or then i guess being able to balance you know multiple like tv show movie video games commercials all that like you just have to be able to write everything fast so you have enough time to do everything um but I think I balance that also with I write quickly, but then I give myself time to step away from it so that I can come back with fresh ears since I don't have someone to be like, hey, come listen to this. You know, I have to be that person. So I work on something else for a few hours or come back to it the next morning or something. And then it's very apparent. I'm like, oh, that's a little loud. That doesn't need to be there. OK, done. That kind of thing. Incredible. So that's really, really like the, the real world application of all your of, of everything was it yeah was it what you were looking for when you think back to what you thought being a composer was and, and what you first stepped into how how did those two things compare oh that's a good question you know I, I don't know what i thought it would be like but i think it was definitely what i was looking for and it was great i mean it wasn't without its hardships and trials and stuff but yeah i just wanted to get my hands on as much as I could as many projects as I could you know and do write as much music as I could and learn as much as I could and it was definitely the right place for that so cool it just dawned on me that I mean we're saying Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo so so easily but what for people who aren't exactly familiar with his composing uh -huh. credits like what, what are some of the highlights that you that you would oh, man. sort of He's say been so successful for so many years at this point but like early on his, uh, his earliest probably like composing credits were like Pee Wee's Playhouse the TV the TV show Rugrats was a big one then my uncle Bob took that over and was scored that for many years um the he's well known for his Wes Anderson movies like he did the first like I forget four or five Wes Anderson movies and they were still happening when I was there which was really really cool and then more recently like he did a th uh, Marvel movie one of the Thor movies um, I believe it was Love and Thunder uh, he wrote a song for that Lego movie that was huge um, it's huge huge yeah, yeah you know, like outside of Devo huge stuff you know, now I yeah I mean known. And yeah so and then everybody working in there, the mm -hmm. Musato is his, his... Mutato Musica. Mutato, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mutato. Okay. What, where, where does that come from? What is that I word? Think I mean, to him, it means mutated music. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then everybody there kind of writes <laughs> in the style of, of his work? Or what is that uh, arrangement like when you work at a place like that where there's one head? I think it varies. I mean, yeah. It? I mean, you know, essentially people are coming there for him. Um, but there's a, you know, a lot of times you're asked to write... In, and he's asked to write and it's rare to be a composer and people are like, I want your sound. That's pretty rare. It probably happens to him more than most people or Danny Elfman or people that are kind of iconic. But like in general, if you're a composer, a lot of times what happens is like, they're like, I want something that's rocking and I like these bands that play rock, you know, do something kind of like that or whatever, or they don't know, you know, or just, I don't know, I guess orchestral, you know, it's very vague most of the time. So you have to be adept at different genres and styles or be a specialist and just be known for the one thing. That's the other route to take. But as a freelancer, I, I don't have that luxury of just being, you know, just doing the one thing, but I also don't want to, like, I like, I like different genres of music. I like digging in and finding out what, you know, what makes Cumbia tick and what specific genre of it and, you know, things like that. Uh, and so, yeah, the people working for him, I imagine, have to, you know, they, they, they balance a lot of different genres and styles and stuff, yeah. And had you been a fan of, of soundtracks and things like that prior to, oh, yeah. to getting to work in there? Yes. Okay. 
what were some of the early sort of influences or things that, that kind of stood out to you as like soundtrack stuff? That you're like, whoa, like this uh, is this uh, is my world. I want to be in this world. Well, off the top of my head, is it's probably a less traditional soundtrack than you might think. But the Bob Dylan album um, for Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, that movie, I think it was a number one. I think it was the first soundtrack to be number one album if i'm not mistaken knocking on heaven's door knocking on heaven's door was on that which i'm sure is the reason it was number one um but that was a great soundtrack i really liked that a lot um and that got me thinking about soundtracks when i was pretty young and then i think i thought about it more too because i knew that my uncle did that and so i would listen to them more and then of course by the time college rolled around and I was, you know, studying music. Uh, I was listening to a lot of, you know, a lot of soundtracks and trying to kind of familiarize myself and keep up and, um, you know, not only with what was current, but like kind of get familiar with older stuff as well. Incredible. I, I interrupted you earlier when you were saying that as you were working there and then Devo did a reunion. Mm. Was there? Yeah. So Devo? I started as an intern, was juggling commercials, intern stuff. And then since I had the art background, my uncle also was doing a lot of art shows at the time and making art at the studio. And a lot of it was, uh, he would make art and then we would print it out on this special printer that he had. And a lot of, so I was also using a lot of my time to help him with his art stuff, which I really wanted to do. And I liked that a lot because of my art background and connection. And I was doing art shows at the time too. Um, and still making art. Um, but, did a lot of that and then oh yeah so Devo went on tour like they hadn't really been playing shows and all of a sudden they started they did a little tour uh, my uncle Bob was in the middle of scoring All Grown Up which was a Rugrats spinoff and he's like well I can't like how am I going to leave I'm in the middle of this and so he ended up turning it over to myself and another composer there John Enroth who still works there um, good friend great composer and you know they were all kind of like oh can these guys handle this you know because we were the young guys and uh, but he showed us how and, like, you know, taught us what to do. And that was an incredible education. And so once they kind of saw, like, oh, these these guys can handle TV shows, too, then they it kind of seemed like that opened up the floodgates. All of a sudden, they were giving, the older composers were giving us more opportunity to score stuff, I think, because they were also had been doing it for a long time. So they were happy to be like, no, you take on the, you can take on more work. That's fine, you know. Um, and so all of a sudden we were getting to score little scenes in films and things like that, like little bits here and there, and then just taking on more and more and video games and that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, it also depended on the client. Some clients were okay with that. Some just wanted Mark. And so they would just get him and like, you know, just depended on the situation, but most of the time they didn't care as long as the music was good. It's incredible. And, and while all this is going on, is there a balance that you're able to, to find in life or is it all music all the time? Like, yeah, yeah. The one thing that I learned from that age was like, you know, I told you I got up really early to go to work. And I still get up really early in work because I like to be done by like five or six. I don't like working into the evening. I find that I slow down and looking at a computer gets really fatiguing at night for me. Like I just, I'm just not as quick and productive and sharp because I've been up all day. And so, um, the balance that I learned then was, you know, I'm really creative in the morning, maximize that, utilize that, you know, and make it through the day. And then at night that left me the opportunity to like, go hang out, have fun, hang out with friends, hang out with family, you know, um, girlfriends at the time, now wife, of course. Um, and I really, I still maintain that. And I think that's really healthy. And also the other thing that I think the other balance thing that I learned along the way was, um, you know, I wanted to make records and that wasn't part of the job there. They just don't really make records there. You know, it's just about scoring. And so I made records on my own when I, you know, in my free time, which was not much, but you know, I did it and those were great learning experiences. But what I learned along the way was the more, like if you're a composer, if you're lucky enough to be a composer that's working all the time, um, or any creative, maybe you still need to make stuff for yourself to stay, at least this is my experience and what I've observed, to stay engaged, to stay into being creative and all of that, not just give everything away. You need to make stuff for yourself, even if no one ever hears it. Um, if you just are constantly doing it for other people and clients, I think that that can really wear you down. I've seen it wear other people down. And so I still, yeah, I make a lot of records and do creative stuff um, that isn't for a client because 
I think it's important to make things where you're making all the decisions. It can be how you want it to be. And that way that allows you when you go back to working with a client, if they're like, oh, I hate this, cut that out, change that, make it that. And, you know, your finished product is not what you envisioned. You don't love it as much. It doesn't matter. It needs to be what they envisioned. And you have to be okay with that legitimately okay with that because if you want to keep doing it you know what i mean like you have to be all right with that and so having your own projects for me has made me be okay with taking direction from other people and enjoying it and realizing that's my role here what comes to mind when you think about some of the craziest notes you've gotten mm-hmm. when, when, when oh, yeah. stuff comes back or anything oh, man, yeah. pop in your head sure i yeah. mean there's definitely times when I've been told like, oh, this is out of tune and I'll put it in like Melodyne or a program where you can literally see if it's in tune or not and it is completely in tune. And I'm like, okay, well, there I fixed it. You know, like, what are you going to say? Um, but the cr- I think the craziest, the craziest was one of the very first commercials I ever did. A huge burger client. And um, it was just like a piece of techno music. It wasn't anything to write home about. It was like for, a, there was like a fashion thing happening in the commercial. And so it's basically like some electronic drums and like a synth bass just, you know, doing something boring. But the clients come in. I'm, I'm, this is my first meeting with like clients. And I'm pretty nervous because I'm like 23 and like, ooh, this is a big deal, you know. And I'm sitting at an SSL board that's the size of, you know. A small European car. Yeah, exactly. And nothing, I'm not even using it. Like my stuff's running through the computer next to it. Um... But anyway, uh, the, the the creative says, oh, yeah, the character in this, he's, uh, he's you know, the backstory is, in this burger commercial, he grew up on the Austri- <laughs> Austrian-German border. So I, I feel like the kind of music he'd be listening to, the bass sound would be a little bit more orange. Could you make it more orange? As in the color orange. And, you know, so I'm, I, yeah, I have a split second to think about this, but I'm like, either I can be like dude what the fuck are you talking about or I can just say okay and so I'm like okay and I turn around twist some knobs that aren't connected to anything you know and turn back around and I'm like is that better and he's like oh that's perfect and I'm like oh great (laughs) you know that was it it's like sometimes and then I realize like sometimes when it's creativity by committee sometimes people just have to justify their paycheck give a reason that they're there you know and and that's probably what he, he just felt he had to say something, you know, and I, I understand that. But the other thing is, too, is ears can be tricky. My ears can be tricky. I mean, I try and when I'm working on a computer and I'm like EQing something or doing an effect and I'm like, yeah, that's better. And I'm like, OK, is it better because I think it's going to be better and I'm moving my fingers or let's close my eyes here and listen. Does it really make a difference? You know, so audio can be deceiving, you know. Absolutely. But. Yeah, that's great. I love the, the producer knob. Or the producer mm-hmm. switch, or the you know, yeah. and like, I'm oh, sure yeah, I read that, like, because like, that's an old, you know, you, I think probably if you've read tape op or anything like that, you've read of some engineer having to do that at some point. Like, you have a knob that's connected to nothing. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I just saw there was a great clip going around on on social media of an old time bass session guy, uh-huh. and uh, he's got a he's got a. Oh, is it Lee? Scalar, or? maybe I don't know. I don't recall Huge the yeah, your big beard. Yes, yeah, exactly. And he's him. got the and he's got the switch on the bass. Uh-huh, like, what is this? And like, this? This is the producer switch. Like you know, they say this wants something a little bit different. So then you just you the tones in the fingers, the tones uh-huh. in the playing of it. Like, but I have the switch. I can flip and then play something different. And that's you know just definitely goes, for him. He can do that. <laughs> it's yeah. a visual. It's a visual cue. Like, oh, okay, cool. I'm listening to you. Here's the switch. I'm going to flip and then do it. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, they wouldn't believe you actually changed anything. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I want to get into so records versus is composer score. work or how do you mm. score yeah is that, mm. how do you differentiate them or what's uh, you said one for me one for them like what's the relationship between those two sort of parts of your output well no one's paying me to make records <laughs> <laughs> i've i've never had a record label um it's not because i haven't wanted one i just no one's ever approached me i've never had any contacts at one it just hasn't worked out um but that's okay i i make records that i want to make and, you know, I'm, I write everything, I record everything, play as much as I can. Sometimes I bring in either friends or session players if it's, a, you know, instruments I don't play, like strings, for example. Um, and I mix and produce them. And I just, I love recording and I love being in the studio and creating stuff. And so that's part of it. And there's just, there's time, I think part of it was born out of like, um, genres that I wanted to pursue or th- ideas that I wanted to pursue in music that weren't, that no one was paying me to do. 
And so I, you know, just had to do it myself. For example, this, uh, out West record is very much influenced by spaghetti Western soundtracks. Right. And, uh, I just wasn't, you know, I'm not typically getting hired for that kind of thing. There's not that much of that kind of thing being made anyway. I mean, it's out there, but, you know, it's not prevalent. And I wasn't being hired for it. So during the pandemic, when work really slowed down, I was like, man, this is on my bucket list. And like, if I don't do it, I might never get to do it. So I, I just made that record and it was incredibly fun to make. And I think that, I think you can hear it when you listen to it. Like, I just had a blast doing it. It yeah. sounds incredible. I've listened to the Thank three you. singles. Yeah, um, um, I listened to the three singles that uh, that are up on Spotify right now, and it's amazing. And, and the quality of the mix and the and the instrumentation, oh, and the arrangements, you. like it's they sound like nineteen sixties oh, cool. songs. Thanks. You know these Sergio Leone songs. Mm-hmm. How were you able to sort of land that plane? I mean, it really. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just uh, it, it actually felt very natural. I just knew what instruments were I felt were appropriate that I wanted to use. And of course, it's also like, what instruments do I have on hand? Um, How many people do I want to hire? And so for this, I think I just hired trumpet, which is a main kind of thing. It definitely is a big voice in this. So I hired a trumpet player because I don't play trumpet. Daniel Rosenboom, awesome. Um, Upright bass, I don't play upright bass. So some of the songs are electric and I played it, some are upright. There's a little bit of strings on there too. And so some string players, but um, most of the stuff I was, you know, I try and with my records, I try and play as much as I can because I feel like then it's more of a representation of me um, because it reflects my limitations and my um, yeah, the things I'm good at, whatever. So there's a lot of percussion on it because I'm a percussionist. Um, and yeah, just, you know, I just kind of wanted to, um, like not show but represent sort of my my influences of growing up in the southwest you know and i wasn't really trying to make a spaghetti western record but that was that's a big part of the sound and also um like that pat garrett and billy the Kid soundtrack that was like in my head the um the band calexico from tucson when i was in college we would see them all the time and met them a couple times super nice um they're really great and you know the mariachi influence is huge in tucson and so I just kind of wanted all of these musical influences that I felt the Southwest has had on me. You know, I kind of wanted to reflect all of that and put it through my prism or whatever, you know. And the record you did before that, too, was, was also beautiful. The Taiko drums or the, uh-huh. the Fushigi. kind of... Fushigi. Yes, yeah. Fushigi was a weird, <laughs> was a weird one. I was, I was really surprised and happy that people um, seemed to really like it. Um, Fushigi was a concept album. <laughs> it was the first time I had done that. And... Uh, it was made for vinyl. So side A is um, an imagined underwater journey. So you leave California, you submerge, you go underwater. And so the first couple of tracks are sort of preparing for the journey. Then you're underwater and it's, you know, sounds underwater-y, I guess. And, you know, then you're traveling underwater and the mysterious weird things that are there. And then side B, you emerge in Japan. And then it's sort of these... Um, my memories and recollections of being in Japan a couple of times and my impressions of that. And so I didn't want to like make quote unquote Japanese music, but I wanted to use some instruments from Japan and work with players from, you know, Japanese players to sort of reflect that, to reflect the geography, but also because I wanted to learn about those instruments. I had been hired to, to score a show for Netflix called Street Food Asia before that. And, um, they had wanted at some point they had wanted me to use Japanese instruments because I was scoring an episode that was set in Japan and I didn't have much experience with them, you know, so I was diving into it, but I was realizing my limitations there. And so my favorite way to learn about instruments is to either take lessons on it or write for, you know, do some studying and write for it and then hire a player and learn what I've done wrong, you know, and what works and what doesn't. And so that was sort of an opportunity for me to get more familiar with some traditional Japanese instruments. Um, I took some taiko drum classes. If you don't know what taikos are, they're giant Japanese drums. Uh, There's different sizes. Some are small too. But um, So I took some lessons from a place called Asano Taiko in Torrance. And then I rented some from a place called LA Percussion Rentals in Santa Clarita, which is not too far from us. Lovely people awesome stuff they have so many great instruments rented those recorded them at my studio um and then i hired some players that play you know shamisen um koto uh things like that some traditional japanese instruments and tried to weave those in in a way that was 
through how I wanted to use them more so than like trying to sound Japanese, you know, it was just like, here's another color for the instrument palette, you know, it's another voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was all recorded here. Yeah. I record everything at my studio, mix it all there, produce it. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, really it's such a journey, right? It's one of those things, you know, I think as, as a, as a listener, you hear it and you're like, did you go to Japan? (laughs) And then I wanted, I didn't want it to just be these ancient instruments because that's, you know, their traditional instruments are, are pretty old at this point. They've been around for a long time, but I didn't want the, to just be like an ancient Japan experience or something. So I did use some synths and like more modern sounds to try and represent that it's, you know, a very modern cutting edge culture as well. Yeah. 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 No, all of it stood out there. You know, that's nice. incredible. And Thank then you. has the circle ever become complete where a song you've used, you know, that you've recorded for your personal records, has that ever ended up yes. getting back onto screen somehow? Like, what? It does. It does more and more and more. And so it's so, and though that always feels the best. That's so rewarding and encouraging when that happens. Um, I don't sell a lot of physical copies cause I'm not touring or playing shows or anything. Right. So it's very hard to sell stuff if you're not out there pounding the pavement, as you know, being oh, someone yeah. that does pound the pavement. Um, <laughs> it's hard to sell stuff even when you pound the yeah, pavement. Really. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, I definitely don't uh, make the money back through selling physical, you know, records or CDs or anything. Um, but I am able to license these songs. And so... You know, they, they've found their way into different commercials, movies, TV shows, all kinds of different places they pop up. And, uh, yeah, it's super rewarding. And eventually the records do become profitable or I recoup my losses and then hopefully become profitable past that. Um, but that's only been in the last, like, maybe four or five years that that's happened. And, I, you know, I probably made 20 records, including, you know, maybe EPs and stuff with other bands and things. But, you know, it's a long road for that stuff to sometimes happen. But it does and it's super rewarding when it does and so yeah now i am getting approached like hey we liked your music from fushigi or i did a record called sounds for a dinner party that's been licensed a lot and um that you know we we like these tracks and then then it is we want you to sound like you which is really nice and like everyone hopes to get to that point but it's not easy you know It, it doesn't just happen if you had a nephew, you know, from Arizona come to you and say, uncle, what do I, I want to do what you do. What, what, what sort of advice do you tell people or what sort of where, what direction would you give somebody who's trying to do what you do? You know, I would hope that I would be encouraging, but honestly, it's a tough road. I mean, there's no, the, I think I would balance it with some real advice that they probably wouldn't listen to. Like it's a tough road. There's never a stage where you've made it. If you stop working, it goes away. There's no retirement plan. There's no like, you know, sitting back and resting on your laurels at all. There's never a I made it stage. And I don't even think even like successful music artists that are selling records today, like, uh, you know, huge pop stars and stuff. It's really tough to get to that level anymore because physical units aren't selling that kind of thing. There's not much money in streaming, that kind of stuff. I think it's even worse as a composer. It's very difficult. Everyone is doing it now. It's a very jam packed. So I would say have a great backup plan if it doesn't work out. Blue man group. Blue man Stop group. with the like. Yeah, Cirque or, or an accounting degree or yeah. something where you can actually get a real job. Because during the pandemic, I realized how useless my skill set is doing anything else. Like, I'm really good at one thing, you know. And then aside from that, like, you know, the job stopped there for a, a while during the pandemic. And even when it picked up, it was very slow getting back to the way it was. And I just realized, like, I can't even get a job doing anything else besides maybe working at Starbucks or something like it just, you know, I don't have the skills for it. And so I regret not having a broader skill set outside of music. But that said, I think if you're, you know, if they're hell bent on being a composer, a musician or whatever, I think there's a couple of things. One, be dependable, like you show up on time or early don't ever flake on a deadline. You always turn things in before or when they're due. Be a great communicator. Always, you know, if you if you have clients, you need to be really clear with them and understand how to communicate in their style and what they need and read between the lines of what they need. And also to be fun to work with and be a fun person to be around because a lot of composers, um, they are grumps. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of uh, being a composer is a lot of being alone and being in a studio in, in a room by yourself. 
and I like that. But like, uh, I think a lot of times it, it, it turns people into kind of antisocial a little bit. And, um, and this is what I've heard from people that aren't composers, from directors, editors, whatever. I don't like working with this composer because they're grouchy. I ask them for something and they don't want to do it. You know, those kind of things. It's like, you won't last long if that's the sort of composer you are. So you need to be friendly and easy to work with, just like any other business. You know, like if you're deal- if you're hiring someone, you want them to be friendly, good at their job, communicative. Think about it like that. I love to nerd out on gear. Sure, you me know, too. Yeah. And um, what what are three pieces of gear that you could not do your job without? Okay, well, you've mentioned how good my records sound a couple of times, um, which I really appreciate. That I thank you. I take a lot of pride in in my mixes, and but I think a big part of it is uh, when I was younger, before I left the studio I was at, I got to play with a lot of different microphones. They had a bunch of vintage mics, and I fell in love with the Neumann U47, which is, you know, obviously everyone, a lot of people think of that as like a holy grail type mic. I saved my pennies from for a long time, and I bought one, and I use that on almost every acoustic instrument because it just sounds incredible. And I have that running through some Neve mic pre's. So that would probably be number two. So that chain is like my golden chain for sounding good. And if you have a good player and a good instrument on the other side of it, if you mess that up, you're, you know, that's on you. You've messed with it too much. Like, cause it's going to sound good. Okay. So those two things, the, the U47, some Neve 1073 mic pre's, and I don't have a ton, you know, um, but you don't need a ton. And then I have a bajillion weird instruments, so that probably helps but if I had to pick one, I have this thing called a guitar veal, which I can't remember if I showed you when you came over or not. It's been a while because of the stupid pandemic. But um, the guitar veal is uh, basically a cross between kind of like a cello and a guitar. So it's it's fretted. It's it's actually fretless, but it's set up like a guitar. So it's strung like a guitar so that a guitar player knows where the notes are. Okay. Um, but, but the neck is curved so that you can bow and hit all the strings very easily. And so you get like string sounds, but because I don't know how to play a cello, um, you know, I know the fingering for a guitar and so I can find the notes that way. Um, it doesn't sound like a cello really. It doesn't sound like a guitar either. It's kind of this in between. It's its own thing. And I use it a lot for just creating sounds that, you're not really sure what instrument it is, but it's clear that a person is playing it. Even if the audience isn't thinking about it, they're somehow unconsciously, they know that it's real. It's not a fake, it's not a sample, you know, it's not a synth pad or something. It's a, it's a lot, you can hear a bow being pulled across something. So that's one of my go-to favorite kind of things. And they're made by an awesome fellow just north of Los Angeles. I think he's in Santa Clarita named uh, Jonathan Wilson. And it's called Toga Man is the name of his guitar veals. And they're, they're really cool. Incredible. Great. So where can people find you if they want to hear more about you and, and listen to some of your music? What, what are some, yeah. some... Silasheight.com is my website. But if you just Google Silas Height, fortunately it's a you know unique enough name that you'll find me. I'm, I've got lots of albums on all the streaming places and all that stuff. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Silas. I appreciate it. Yes. There he is, the incredible Silas Height. Everybody go out and stream his new record and uh, look up all the incredible stuff he has out there online. It really is great music to uh, chill out, chillax, chill your brain with, and uh, he's super scary talented. So thank you, Silas, for coming over and doing that. Uh, again, want to thank all the sponsors, um, DistroKid and Native Instruments. Go treat yourself, treat someone you love, the music nerd in your life, and... Uh, uh, hit that link in my bio. Is that what you do? No, you go to uh, distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash hyphen it to uh, get a discount when you get your music up online there, as well as native instruments.com and use the code ruin10, R U I N 10 at checkout for incredible discounts there as well. Thank you. And thank you to you people at home or at the gym or in the car or folding laundry or mowing the lawn, or walking your dog, all the fun things you do. Uh, Thank you for listening, and uh, stay mellow, and remember, give yourself a break this holiday season. Don't stress out. We'll get through it together. And uh, I'll be back next week with my co-host Aaron Farley for the incredible Halftime Wrap-Up. All right. 
Peace.